Our main program is about today's health care crisis and what we can do. Here to introduce the speaker is Bob Watt, the president of Group Health Cooperative, and for the rest of the month with the Boeing commercial airplanes. Just one amendment to that. It was my great privilege to serve as chair of the Group Health Cooperative Foundation Board at one point in my life, but Scott is the president and CEO of Group Health, and I am deeply grateful that I am not. <laughs> He's also wanting to allow time for Q&A, so let's get right to the introduction. Scott leads an organization of 9,000 women and men dedicated to quality health care. He's been in that job since January of 2005. Group Health, as you may not know, does include 900 physicians, the Center for Health Studies, a nationally recognized research center, and indeed the Group Health Community Foundation, which just was named Philanthropic Corporation of the Year in Washington State at the National Philanthropy Day Awards. Besides his local and readership regional leadership, including the Business Partners for Early Learning. Scott has a full plate leading nationally in healthcare. That makes him ideally positioned to be one of the people who is part of the solution and not part of the problem. A graduate of Hamilton College in New York, in New York he also holds a Master of Arts in Business with a concentration in hospital administration from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He, his wife, Sarah, and their two daughters live here in Seattle. He's an avid bicyclist. Group health sponsorship of SDP includes that he rides it every year and takes his whole leadership team with him whenever he can get them to do it. He's a longtime friend. I'm a 35-year recipient of some of the best health care in the region from Group Health. It's my privilege to w introduce Scott, Car Scott Armstrong, President and CEO of Group Health. <laughs> well, momentarily, I did have an identity crisis there, but now I know who I am. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bob. And thank all of you for the invitation to talk to you today. When Bob Alexander and I talked several months ago about this presentation, uh, he asked me to address the question you've heard a few times now. What can you do to help address the health care crisis? And I recognize that this would be a great opportunity for us to talk about really, truly the important roles that everyone in this room can play in, in improving the health in our communities, and I'll get to that in just a little bit. First, though, I would like to share a few thoughts with you about the health care system and to talk about the debate around reforming health care that's uh, obviously evolving all around us. I hope that as a result of some comments I'll make here that you'll leave with a sense of your own personal stake in the issues related to health care, not only in shaping the debate that, that will unfold, but in the responsibility that every one of us in this room has to make a difference in health, and that's obviously through our own personal health, uh, because I'm sure you know that the two are quite uh, deeply connected to one another. <clears throat> now, you've you've heard many times, uh, but uh, already, but because it's true, I will say it again: our healthcare system is a mess. There is a lot of noise right now being made about how we can fix our system. And the noise usually promotes some kind of silver bullet universal solution to it. But the truth is that healthcare has many different issues and uh, compound ailments that won't be solved through a single solution. To talk about this, I'd like to s simplify things and frame 
a discussion about healthcare into three broad, related but different categories or issue areas to address. First of all, and I think you'll find them to be very familiar, first of all, there is the issue of the rising cost of health care. Sound familiar? Our current system is expensive, and it is rising at three times the rate of general inflation in our country. And today, in case you weren't worried enough about this already, there is no plan for how Medicare and Medicaid will be paid for 20 years from today. We don't have an idea. This is a serious fiscal problem for our country. And then there's the issue of how people access their health care system. The present system leaves out nearly 50 million people around this country who do not have insurance. In our state alone, there are 600,000 people who don't have health insurance. Many of you in this room may not, but these are our friends, our neighbors, our, our family members, people who work hard. And the issue isn't just about costs. It's about public policy. In our country, we believe that everybody has a right to basic education, to police protection, to fire departments. But we have not yet committed to assuring that everyone in this country has access to basic health care. Now, that's a problem. And the third issue that is familiar, I'm sure, in this reform discussion relates to the way in which clinical care is organized and delivered. Our present system is fragmented, it's difficult to deal with, and as I'm sure many of you already know, frankly, the outcomes from our healthcare system are not that good. I know you'll be hearing about these first two problems, the cost and the access to clinical care, as the reform debates uh, heat up. <clears throat> We're entering a presidential election year, and every candidate has a proposal, uh, and uh, uh, reform, as you would expect, for health care is the major domestic issue. Uh, Plus, in the face of gridlock in Washington, D.C., state governments, state legislators, King County executives, mayors, they are all taking responsibility for coming forward with real solutions. And in your own businesses, creative new approaches to promoting health are, uh, are examples are, are uh, uh, all around us, whether they have to do with promoting health and wellness or shifting, you know, inflationary cost of health care. However, I would just tell you that based on my own experience, I am convinced that real reform, productive reform, that makes a difference in the long run, needs to look beyond these issues of how we pay for health care and how we get access to it. They need to look into this third issue, the issue of how is our health care system organized and how is health care better delivered. Now, don't get me wrong. I do want to acknowledge money matters. Uh, I am, uh, as Bob told you, I'm president and CEO of one of the largest private employers in the state. I spend $70 million every year for the medical benefits for my 9,000 employees. Ironically, I also run the health plan that every year keeps raising my rates for those medical benefits, <laughs> and I'm not happy about it. But rising costs, and by the way, I know that's an issue that every one of us in this room can relate to. How do we manage an empl important employee benefit without bankrupting our company and without harming the people that work for us? Obviously, it's a huge issue, and I certainly can relate to it. But these rising costs are just a symptom of a health care system that's not working right. And I believe if you're really going to make a difference in confronting the issues of cost, you need to look at how health care is organized. <clears throat> Generally, <clears throat> I would say that our health care system is designed to diagnose problems. It's designed to stop the bleeding and to fix your problem, to cure your illness. It's not designed to promote health. It's not designed to help people live healthier lives with chronic illnesses. And the result is that the system that we've designed gets exactly the outcomes that it was designed to get, which is not very good overall health outcomes. We spend nearly 85% of all health care resources on 15% of the people who get care in it, people who have chronic illnesses, uh, chronic illnesses, by the way, that are ten, tend to be linked to lifestyle choices and choices about exercise and, and diet. Diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, heart disease, you, you're familiar with the list. And despite this expenditure, we're not buying very much improvement in the overall health for people in our country. Here again, you've probably heard many of these statistics, but the United States on this globe is ranked very low in terms of overall health outcomes. 42nd in terms of overall life expectancy. I hope some of you at least are stunned by that because it is alarming. 
But most, most alarming of all, to me anyway, is for the first time in the history of mankind, in our country, the current generation of American children, our children, our grandchildren, they are expected to live shorter, unhealthier lives than their parents. Five years is the estimate by the researchers at the National Institutes for Health. It's astounding that a country that spends twice as much per person than any other country on this globe has such mediocre outcomes. You know, one trend, just to pile on a little bit here, that I find especially disturbing is that, and that highlights the issues of the system, is the alarming uh, rate of, uh, uh, increasing rate of obesity. Today, more than 60% of Americans are considered overweight or obese. And our children are leading the way. In the last 25 years since 1980, the number of overweight and obese children has tripled. For adults, for kids, the simple truth is that we're eating more and we're exercising less. It's not complicated. Really, it's not. And it's making us unhealthy. Research shows strong links between obesity and the onset of these various chronic diseases. Your, your risk of chronic disease increases with every excess pound that you carry. And, and, and you know, even more evidence of, of some of these is, issues is the earlier onset of some of these diseases. The use of cholesterol and blood pressure medications is rising today more among people who are aged 20 to 44 than it is among people 65 and older. Heart attacks, strokes, once fairly common for people over 50, are now striking people in their 30s. And the data goes on and on. Now the good news is that these conditions can be uh, diagnosed, they're preventable, you can live healthy lives once diagnosed with this. But the bad news is that our healthcare system is not doing a very good job of helping us to achieve those goals. By treating the, the effects of obesity rather than its causes, our disease-based approach to healthcare guarantees that our interventions will always be too late and too costly. So given these unfortunate truths, well, what do you do about that? Well, I'd like to suggest that there really are some things that we can do. In fact, I'll offer three powerful ideas for you to consider. First, we need to consider the consistent use of clinical evidence in making clinical decisions. Now, that may sound surprising to many of you, but variation from scientific the use of scientific uh, information in our clinical decisions is enormous and our system has too much toleration for that variation. The second suggestion is that our healthcare system needs to engage each one of us in the management of our own health to view us, you know, not as victims of illness but of active agents in the promotion of our own health and wellness. And then the third idea is that we need to make sure that the pieces of our healthcare system actually work together with a single plan for the care of patients all focused on better health as an outcome. So let me talk about each of these three ideas and, and, and then we'll wrap things up. First, this idea that scientific knowledge should influence our clinical decisions. You probably thought that all clinical decisions were based on the best available science. Well, you would be surprised at how, how infrequently this is actually true. Take, for example, heart attack patients. There is no dispute about the evidence. All uh, people in this country, in this world, agree that patients after their first heart attack, if they are prescribed and take beta blockers and aspirin, have a 20% more likely, uh, are 20% more likely to live. No one argues with this fact. And yet, in our country, our healthcare system is only capable of making sure that 50% of people after heart attacks actually are on those medications. Likewise, there's this incredible and unwarranted uh, variation in the use of surgical procedures from city to city. You've probably heard some of these data. Just one example that really got my attention. The rate of mastectomy for breast cancer in Missoula, Montana is three times the rate in Seattle, Washington. Both communities are not applying the same clinical evidence to these decisions. The same desire to use better evidence in clinical decision decisions should also be really pushing us to 
identify quality measures and report much more publicly on how our system is doing against those measures. You should know, by the way, that right here in the Puget Sound, we're doing some pretty good work on this. The Puget Sound Health Alliance is a consortium of hospitals, health plans, doctors, employers, who are coming together based on this belief that if we identify basic quality measures and we, we report much more publicly, we can make a difference in the overall health and the cost of health care in this community. It's good work. But I would tell you, it's, it is long overdue. Our health care system needs to do a better job of apply, applying clinical evidence, confronting this unexplainable variation in, in clinical practice, and reporting publicly on how our system is doing. A second way to make a real difference in confronting this health care issue, in my mind, is by putting patients back in the center of the health care system. Our system needs to become, help our patients become much more active, much more informed, much more in a role as engaged owners of their own health care. For example, let me, let me just ask a question. How many of you know your numbers? You know your cell phone number, you know your social security number. I happen to know my Alaska Airlines MVP number. <laughs> but how many of you know your cholesterol? How many of you know your BMI? Uh, this is a pretty healthy group. Uh, how many of you know your blood pressure? And a, and a growing list of very important measures for all of us to know. It would be inspiring for more people to know this. I assume those of you who have raised your hands know this information and that it influences your choices about what you eat and, and what you do. Our health care system is doing so little to make sure all of us know our numbers. It should do much more. We also need a health care system that recognizes that your clinical information is your information. What a concept. Each one of us should be able to easily access our lab results, our medical histories, summaries of our last visits to our physicians, how about a list of all the medications that you're, you're, uh, you've got prescribed? Easily accessible. What about a chart plotting the gradual improvement in your cholesterol levels? I know that some of us can look at this information easily. Most of us cannot. We should be able to get access to this. Our healthcare system needs to help us with that. That's our information, and it would inspire us to improve our health if we could. If healthcare were more engaged or more focused on engaging patients, think about this too. Each of us, as an active uh, participant, um, uh, wouldn't involve the way that it does spending so much time waiting in lines. For example, we could email our doctor with a clinical question and expect an answer on, with clinical advice to the next day instead of assuming. We need to wait in a waiting room and wait in an exam room and wait and wait. Or what about refilling your prescriptions? Why can't you make a phone call or click three times on a website and know that that prescription will be mailed to your home? Instead, we make you wait. Our healthcare system isn't thinking about you as a patient. It's not putting you in the middle, and it needs to, and it would make an enormous difference if it did. Third and finally, one of the most fundamental failures of our healthcare system is that it is not a system at all. You think about this. It, it needs to work much more like a cohesive, integrated system where all the component parts know better, even than you, the patient, what's going on in your health. Consider this scenario. You're up at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, you feel terrible. Uh, you think you might have the flu. It could be your ulcer acting up. It could be much worse. In an integrated healthcare system, you would not, where the pieces all hold together, you would not hesitate to pick up the phone and to know at the other end of the line would be a nurse or a doctor who would have immediate access to all of your clinical information, who would be able to look at your visit summaries, your diagnoses, your prescriptions, who would engage in a con constructive conversation offering you clinical advice. You would be confident and armed with all that information, decisions would be made about your next steps. But most important, everyone who cares for you after that moment, the next minute that you're off the line, whether it's a doctor or a pharmacist or a lab, would know that you called, would know why you called, and would know what the conclusion was from that conversation. That is an integrated healthcare system 
It seems so simple. I assure you, it's a powerful way of improving health and lowering costs. But our healthcare system today does not do a very good job of creating that kind of integration. So the debates about healthcare reform are going to get loud and prevalent. Uh, they will cover a lot of ground. They'll fo focus mostly on a lot of rhetoric about cost and access. Uh, universal insurance and so on. These are certainly important issues and group health and I have really very clear pr positions on, on those issues. But by themselves, I want you to really think about whether they go far enough because I don't think they do. Simply reforming how people pay for or get access to health care is not alone going to increase the likelihood that science is actually influencing clinical decisions. It's not going to help actively engage people in their own health and put them in the center of the system. And it's not going to help a current non-system work more like a real system and focus all the integrated parts toward better health and better uh, uh, lives living with chronic illness over the course of time. So I hope that um, you can see that Bob Alexander's question to me, what can you do to help deal with the health care crisis is a question that's important, it's timely, clearly a question I care deeply about. The recent challenge grant from Rotary, uh, from the Gates Foundation to Rotary International to combat polio worldwide is a profound endorsement of your commitment to health. It speaks volumes about your spirit of service and I believe that spirit leads you to be influenced to do something about this health care issue. First, as an individual, you can take responsibility for your own health and the health of your family. You knew I was going to say that, didn't you? Watch what you eat, exercise. I know last week your speaker talked about the things you can do to be more healthy and fit. But let me just ask you, how many of you actually made a change in the choices you make as a result of last week's speaker? The point, of course, is you have the power to reform health care and the choices that you personally make. Exercise it. No pun intended. Second, as a business leader, you can start asking some pretty serious questions about the health care benefits and the health care system that your employees are cared for within. How does it promote the use of, of clinical evidence? Does it make it easy for patients to be actively engaged in their own health care? Do they have access to their information? Can they ask questions? Do they have to wait in lines? Does it promote an integrated approach? to aligning all the parts of the system toward the patient's better health. Asking these questions as business leaders, I believe you can make a profound impact on how the healthcare system does better. And finally, as Rotarians, you can do what you do best, which is to provide a forum to focus some of our brightest minds on what I believe is the toughest domestic issue for our generation. As the healthcare issues uh, become front and center and the discussions and debate heat up, continue to make this podium available to people with ideas about how to reform health practice and how to reform our system. And ask them tough questions, not just about cost, but about quality. Take a lead in moving this discussion beyond politics and ideology, because it doesn't happen very often on the other coast. Our community needs your focus on these issues. It will benefit significantly if you offer it. You know, too often when we're confronted with these complex problems, it's easy to put our head in the sand and just assume that somebody else is going to take care of it. Well, I hope you conclude that health care is one of those issues that you cannot avoid getting involved with. And sitting uh, here in this room is the power to get started on confronting some of these issues. We can start right here, right now, with you and the choices that you make. So thank you. Thank you for allowing me to offer this challenge to you today. We do have time for a few questions. So uh, if you have one, think about it now. And if you have one, raise your hand. And the mic will come to you. Be sure and wait for the mic, because that's how we get it on television. Hi, I'm uh, Jim Spady. Oh, I'm sorry, I have a microphone here. And we have about 100 employees at uh, Dick's Drive-In Restaurants. Most of them are very young. And uh, what I find is that because of the community, community rating system, 
My employees who make about $10 an hour on average are subsidizing the health care of people who are older, wealthier, and make two, three, four, or five times more money. And uh, I don't understand, uh, it doesn't seem fair uh, to my employees uh, or my business that that should be the case. And I'm wondering if you could address that. Well, uh, it, you raise a topic that we could go on for hours about. But I would simply say that health insurance is insurance. And the issues that you're talking about imply that there really is policy that needs to be reformed. Part of what's happening is that we don't have universal access and guaranteed issue for all people in this country to insurance. And if we had that, then uh, some of those issues that you're talking about wouldn't, uh, wouldn't persist. What do you see as the effect of nonprofit hospitals and healthcare insurers converting to for-profit? Why do we even allow this? And uh, what does this do to our control as a community of hospitals and health care insurers? Well, my, first of all, I believe for-profit organizations are capable of providing quality care. But uh, I, I strongly believe in the not-for-profit system around health care. My most uh, significant concern is that you know, organizations that provide health care and invest in health care systems are making investments in the community. They're not just businesses. Uh, and a not-for-profit status for an organization assures that mission focus for our organizations. And finally, margin is generated by not-for-profit organizations. For local not-for-profit organizations, the margin is reinvested in a local community. And I think that's, that's a, it's an important feature of how our healthcare organizations are organized. Thank you for the question. Uh, thanks, Scott, for a very thoughtful talk. Uh, one of the other things the speaker last week mentioned was that uh, obviously knowledge has not led everybody to change their lifestyles so that we all live a healthy lifestyle. Would you have any more uh, definite suggestions about incentives that might help people uh, or get, at least get their attention about it? You know, um, thank you for the question, uh, and thank you for being here, by the way. Um, I, I don't have a magic uh, bullet, uh, but I would just say whenever I'm asked that question, I find it so curious. We're asking ourselves, what more powerful incentive is there than health and avoiding death? <laughs> you know, there are a lot of ideas about financial incentives and so forth, but come on. I mean, let's, let's engage in a conversation about what really matters. Who's, uh, who among the presidential candidates is talking the right talk, from your perspective? <laughs> I, f first, I would just say I'm not endorsing any candidate or a party. Uh, in general, I would say they each have decent points. None of them, however, hold together in a way that focuses on the improvements to the health care system that I've just been talking about. And I really would urge you to look for candidates who are beginning to talk about how health care itself can be improved by the reform proposals that they're bringing forward. So no one is the answer. Thank you very much. I thought on that last question I should save Scott by saying, time's up, <laughs> and he didn't have to answer it. Well, anyhow, uh, thank you very much, uh, Scott, uh, for those thoughts and the, and the answers to the questions. These are all things that impact each of us. Next week, we're back here again. Our speaker will be Michael Wilson, the Canadian ambassador to the United States. We've gotten the Chinese ambassador, and now we're going to have the Canadian ambassador. For the short program, we'll have a report about the Rotary Boys and Girls Club. Thank you for being a Rotarian with me today. We're adjourned. <laughs>